Humans have dominated the world for centuries. They've banded together, built great civilizations, but what if they weren't alone? Well, let me show you. I split 200 players into four races. The Arachnids, Humans, Undying, and Shroomites. Each race was placed onto their own island and players were only given one life each. If they die, they remain dead forever. The rest of what happened was completely up to the players and made for a story that you do not want to miss. I present... Again, thank you to Magicum and Ish for the inspiration. And the event was on. The islands the players were split into contained many mysterious elements. But here's what the players knew. There were invisible borders surrounding their islands that prevented them from traveling too far. They also knew that these borders would magically disappear on the fourth day. As such, immediately the players scattered, all racing to be the first one to chop down a tree. The Undying were having an especially fun time with this because of the fact that they burned in the sunlight. Oh wait, we don't burn yet! We don't yeah, burn. We burn. Yeah, yeah, we burn. Yeah, we burn. For the rest of the players, though, they formed exploration groups in hopes of finding the perfect spot to settle. A few humans actually discovered one of the two villages located on their island. These villages came with what would become one of the most valuable resources in the game. Human right violations. It was also grounds to our first in-game death after a certain unlucky player accidentally attacked a villager. Anyways, besides that, let's take a closer look at what players from each race were up to. Traveling to the far off land of the Mesa Island resided the Arachnids. Here, the land was barren on the surface, but shielded away from the harsh sunlight were giant underground cave systems packed with life. The Arachnids here had near unlimited access to vegetation like glowberries and other crops underground. But the Arachnids were purely meat eaters, meaning that they could eat none of it, which I found hilarious. And then to add insult to injury, this is this is actually the only food we have right now. All right, I'll try my best. <laughs> okay. No, please. No. 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 Please. No. Please. No. Please, please, no. Please. To pay for that traumatic experience, I traumatized them more. This is all we have. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Moving on to the Shroomite Island, it was surprisingly civil. The Shroomites had managed to group together and Semel already created a system of government called the Shroomite Republic. The leader of the Republic was a player named Kayonix, and along with half a dozen or so senators. Together, they got to work creating one of the first player-made towns, promptly named the Mycelium Village. This is gonna be the great Mycelium Village. To congratulate them, I gave them the gift of furnaces. Of course, not everyone would be peaceful though. The Shroomites were a very special race. They actually grew stronger when nearby players died around them. As a result, the Republic had already outlawed multiple citizens for attempted murder, something that couldn't possibly have consequences in the future. Now to the Undying Island. The Undying Island, an absolute hellhole. Enjoy your time here with a nice cup of fire own your own beachfront property at the small cost of nothing but fire want food how about fire needless to say the undying were not having a great time not only did they have to run around burning in the daylight but also completely naked too because well they're cursed unsurprisingly not much had been able to be accomplished as most of them just took to hiding in caves and fishing and finally the human island with the help of villagers and a massive deforestation effort, many of the citizens already acquired diamond armory and tools. Afterwards, they immediately started work on their riverside town complete with farms and a fishing dock. Much like the Shroomites, the humans had also managed to create a system of government, which they named the Human Republic. After a long day of settling into their islands, the day was finally coming to an end. The players got together for screenshots, and just like that, on to day two. At the start of day 2, something very peculiar was developing on the Shroomite Island. The players that the Shroomite Republic had exiled were now being told to be killed on sight. Do not allow him to enter the village. Kalos, 
Okay, let's get him. Among these was a player named Granite, who with a group of other exiles would form what would be known as the Blood Cult. But of course not every exile would be as cooperative. Some of them actually seemed to enjoy being exiled and went on to ravage the Shroomai Island. This would result in a series of killings that would eventually go on to be named the infamous Pepsi Incidents. Over on the Undying Island contained a different story. Almost everyone there had managed to gather together and called themselves the Undying Union. Led by Triogami and a few other familiar faces, the Undying had actually created their own national anthem, along with finally starting to see progress with organized efforts of mining, fishing, and exploration. They also located another fortress at the center of the island. Found here were all sorts of resources ranging from apples to diamonds, but most importantly, a blaze spawner. Combine this with the fact that there were traces of ancient debris scattered all over the island, news of this discovery spread quickly, and eventually, Sema made it to the other islands. As soon as the Human Republic got word of this, the higher-ups immediately got to work planning out ways to extract the Undying Island's resources. Only, many of the Human Republic residents didn't seem to take much interest in doing so, preferring to just laze around and construct phallic statues instead, one impressively reaching over 50 blocks tall. But a group of battle-hardened players had enough of the lackadaisical nature, and secretly, left to form their own group. This group contained players like 6969 and Brudor. And just like that, the Human Republic, unknowingly, had just been separated. After multiple days of voting and a slight bit of infighting, the Arachnids had finally managed to establish a system of governing that included seven ministers and one central figure, a player named Almighty. Along with that, there was an established militia led by Rooster and his right-hand man, Ayo. Altogether, they formed the Arachnid Legion and were underway constructing what would eventually become their base. And then on top of that, this... Does anyone have food? No. Food? We're all starving. ...was no longer a problem, as they discovered multiple spider spawners all across their island, providing spider eyes, which they in fact could eat. As the days went on over at the Shroomai Island, the number of Pepsi incident related deaths continued to soar. It continued on this path until finally, the Shroomite Republic was forced to relocate their base due to safety reasons, and in a big turn of events, resorted to asking the Blood Cult for refuge from the other outlaws. Incredibly happy to receive an influx in members, the Blood Cult welcomed the Shroomite Republic with open arms. Alright, uh, gather on guys. There was only one problem though. The Shroomite Republic leader still wanted some control over their citizens, and as a result, led to growing internal disputes within the Shroomite leadership. Feeling threatened, Granite the Blood Cult leader suddenly ordered multiple hits on the Shroomite Republic leader Chaonix. But somehow, all of them failed, with some of the assassins even killing themselves in the process. What? Annoyed, Granite decided to take it upon himself to kill Chaonix, leading to... The Undying Union was having a technological revolution. They had finally managed to cure a villager named Robert that would sell them Curse of Vanishing books. I'm curing him right now. Uh, okay, perfect. Bring the so emerald. Say, you wanna, if you this was a huge breakthrough for them, going from basically nothing to being geared up in full netherite armor. And because this was such a big deal, a few troublemakers on the Undying Island attempted to kill Robert the villager. In retaliation to which, the Undying Union appointed False Hacker as an assassin to kill anyone that would be a threat to the Undying Union, resulting in the safety dispatching of many three criminals. Finally, over on the human island the citizens were gearing up for the following day. With the use of villagers, the humans felt that they were in a very good position compared to all the other races that they believed were rather primitive. Just to be safe though, they started transporting villagers into a bunker to protect their monopoly. Alright, yeah we got most villagers back there I think. Good job. And with that, whether the races liked it or not, began guys, day guys, guys, four. Calm down, calm down.
It was the dawn of day 4, and the Shroomites were already on the move. Because of Granite's actions, the Blood Cult was not safe. So instead of staying on the Shroomite Island and facing certain death, they decided to move out and head towards the Arachnid Island, where then they would seek refuge under the protection of the Arachnid Legion. It was a simple plan. All the Blood Cult had to do was reach the island shores, head into the ocean, and by then, it would be impossible to be caught. Well, nearly impossible. Somehow, the Shroomite Republic now led by a player named Dipiz had caught wind of this plan and were already waiting for them. To make matters even worse for the Blood Cult, the Republic had become a shell of its former values and now ended up partnering with Pepsi Cat, the outlaw responsible for the many Pepsi incidents and by now had absorbed over 20 full hearts, almost quadrupling the HP bar of a regular Shroomite. The death of Chaonix has thrown you all into a fit of irredeemable rage and distress, and I understand that. But know that I did what I did to Chaonix to protect what I and so many others worked so hard to achieve. When the Republic fell and you guys were scrambling for safety, I worked my ass off, as did Zargetsu, as did A5Z, to create a sanctuary in which all people could rest. And when we invited the people of the Republic out of good faith and goodwill, we opened our walls and said, we will house you. He came into my land to demand power over my people. I understand what I did was an irredeemable, scummy, secret murder. And I'm not going to sit here and deny that. But if you're going to ask before I die if I regret what I did, I want you to know that I would kill Chaonix in every lifetime. Meanwhile on the human island, just as the main human republic forces embarked on their journey to gather ancient debris, something was lurking in the shadows. And as it unfortunately turned out, the bloodshed wasn't over yet. This is a raid! Get down on the ground now! This is a raid! Get down on the ground now! The humans that had secretly left the Republic earlier had officially turned against it. Now calling themselves COK, they began their invasion of the Human Republic. Humans were being slain everywhere and it was an absolute bloodbath. Without the support of their main PvPers which were off in the Undying Island, the Human Republic was forced to run, leaving behind everything they had, even their fellow members. We have to leave, we have to leave, we have to leave. Go, 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 go! The Republic base was abandoned and fell under the control of COK, finally ending off the night in what I call the Twin Republic Massacres. The word of the civil wars had spread to the other races now and there have been varied responses. The Arachnids immediately started further fortifying their base and planning out strategies in case COK happened to take an interest in them. In the case of the remaining Shroomites though, they learned of the partnership of Pepsi Cat and trust in the Shroomite Republic plummeted even further. For the Undying, they really seemed to not care about the altercations and continued their newly formed transcontinental trade with the Arachnid. Finally, the humans. The Human Republic was now officially homeless and villagerless, but on the contrary, COK now had double the homes and villagers. But they weren't done yet. After learning about the Shroomite Civil War and how strong Bepsi Cat was growing, they decided that they needed to kill Bepsi Cat now. And so they set off yet again. Midway into the day, first contact was made with Bepsi Cat and the chase was on. He's right here, he's right here. Follow me, follow me, wait. Follow me. No, wait, brother. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm right now chasing. Yeah, don't die, don't both don't die. This chase lasted for almost 20 minutes until finally, Pepsi Cat somehow made it to a group of other Shroomites. Help bros, help me! But due to their distrust in him, Pepsi Cat was ignored and left to die in the hands of COK. Yep. Oh, yeah. We got him blocked in. Oh, yeah. I... Oh, there we easy, go. easy, easy, easy. Can I have his stuff, please? Now traveling all the way to the center of the world, a certain assassin had decided to retire from his line of duty. Having served as the Undying Union's executioner since almost day one, False Hacker now wanted to relax. Dude, I just need I just needed a uh, what's it called? A jungle log to mass produce uh, what's it called coffee, cause cocoa beans. As such, he opened up a coffee shop on an artificially constructed island, which he named Zen Island. And I'm just living here, cause I have nowhere else to go. 
Let's be real here, warfare. So I'm just gonna live here. The human republic was no longer homeless. Learning from their mistakes, they started construction on their new base now located hundreds of blocks into the air. Unlike in the past, now every human was doing their part in helping recover from their loss on day 4 and through sheer hard work, within a day they had created a sky fortress, recovered some of their lost villagers, and even built a giant statue to honor their losses. But not everything was as completely well off. Over at the Arachnid Island, they were quickly growing to be known as the safest and most organized nation. Outside players would frequently visit the island for trade and commerce, but one fateful night, the Legion's worst nightmares came true. Members of COK were spotted traversing the Arachnid Island and immediately, everyone was given the order to disperse. Surprisingly though, COK ran right past the main base and instead were heading towards a different location the Arachnid Legion's military bunker. Secretly, they snuck down one by one, until finally, they made their appearance. COK had finally met their match. Finding themselves trapped in the center of Arachnid territory, they could barely move and much less fight back. Like moths to a flame, three members of COK were slain compared to the single loss that the Arachnid suffered. It was a decisive victory for the Legion, but little did the players know, this victory would lead to the complete breakdown of the world. A massive scandal had just been brought to light within the Arachnid Legion. The attack on the Arachnid militia yesterday was revealed to be a premeditated strike orchestrated by none other than the leader of the Arachnid Legion herself, Almighty. Almighty claimed that the militia had been siphoning resources out of the Legion without permission and generally ignoring the Legion's needs while fueling their own expeditions. Coming to the conclusion that the Legion would be better off without the militia, she decided that the best course of action would be to install a new militia. Issue with that is that B wants to kill us. So he, okay, well, we go, we go, well, for whatever information, he said that he is invading our island. The Arachnid militia, of course, had no idea any of this was happening, and after successfully defending themselves, they immediately labeled Almighty as a kill on sight. But with almost the whole Arachnid legion backing her, this set up a stalemate. The legion greatly outnumbered the militia, but in turn, the militia heavily outgeared the legion. The only option for both sides were to look outwards, beginning what would be the Grey Arms Race. The first place both sides looked towards was the Undying Island. With the Arachnid Legion and Militia now separate, the Undying Union was now considered the greatest powerhouse in the world. While the Arachnid Legion in the past was considered the center of world trade, the Undying Union took on more seclusionist ideals, mostly keeping to themselves and only leaving their island at times to trade. With all this time spent alone and unbothered, their power had grown considerably since the days of running around naked and on fire. And due to their past trade relationships, they ultimately decided to side with the Legion. Now the militia was in a bad spot, but fortunately for them, there was yet another growing, or rather regrowing, powerhouse. The Human Republic. Their tenacity was incredible, and now going by the ancient laws of the enemy of my enemy is my friend, the Human Republic had a bone to pick with COK. Okay, okay, I need a fire sword badly, so if you, if you have We have one at base. Like, bet, bet, bet. Wait, wait. We it, have a villager right? with it. Oh, villagers? And just like that, they were in. It was the day, 
The stage was set and the tension was enormous. Each side held their pre-war meetings, the Legion within the Undying Base and the Militia in the Human Republic Sky Base. We are here today to challenge our enemies. I'll take it, I'll take it. Let me take my- We are here to declare war. This is the group that will take down- We are here to declare war. We will take down Bean and oh, Almighty Rebel against our enemies of the Arachnids. TNT, get out. Oh, get out. Oh, get out. Oh, get my god. <laughs> Almighty had been killed, and to make matters even worse for the Legion, the explosion had been pinned on COK. I didn't do it though! What the heck? Immediately, the players started attacking the COK members. Stop it, please! Stop! Leading to some deafening cries that'll make you almost forget about the many war atrocities they've committed. I didn't do anything! I'm serious! Stop! I didn't even do this! I'm serious! Stop it! The whole betrayal was organized by one of the Undying Council trio Gami, who somehow managed to die during the fight, but nonetheless had ultimately achieved his goal. When he had learned about the partnership with COK, he did what he thought was best for the future and took matters into his own hands, leading to the deaths of Almighty and members of COK. But the problem was that this was completely unannounced, with only a few select members of the Undying that even knew of this plan. Completely outraged that their government would do something so cowardly, groups of Undying began leaving the Union en masse. And for the Legion, they fled for their lives and now newly without a leader. Directionless, they stumbled across a certain artificial island that hosted a lone coffee shop. Welcoming in the wary travelers, False Hacker listened to their story of how things had come to this. Surprised by the actions of his own government, he decided to come back from retirement for one final fight. False Hacker was elected as the new leader of the Legion and pulled together all the resources he could muster. Reaching out to the remaining Shroomites left on the Shroomite Island, they agreed to help the Legion due to COK freeing them from Pepsi Cat's terror in the past. The many Undying that had also defected from the Union all decided to join the Legion upon False Hacker's request. And as a final gift from COK beyond the grave, the Legion gained access to COK's treasure stash containing dozens of villagers and other valuable supplies. The Undying Union, on the other hand, made their way towards the Arachnid Island to meet up with the militia and regroup. No longer split by race, but by betrayal, misfortune, and distrust, the final clash between the Legion and militia was underway. No words needed to be exchanged as they charged into battle. Despite their best efforts, False Hacker was killed and shortly after, most of the Legion fled the battle. 
As bloody as the war was, it led to peace. Players together explored the world, partook in religion, and mourned over their losses. Treaties were created as to never allow this to happen again, and all in all, the day came to an end.